If you have your Bibles, please turn to Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2. Now, before I begin, as is your tradition, um, I'm very happy and honored to answer any questions from the first um, worship that you might have. Are there any, any questions anybody would venture to ask? Yes, Yvonne. How we as a church is, are instructed to deal with a um, with an with an issue uh, from one member doing that is against um, that they shouldn't be doing, and we're taught, you know, to go to the brother, to the sister. Nothing happens. Go. And you know we have that formula. Can that or how would that formula work if there's a division, not so much within a congregation, as with uh, a group of of Christians? Now that I'm asking the question, it's kind of we talk a group of Christians that really have no. No one thing, no one person in authority. Yeah, it sounds like what you're asking is you're describing Matthew 18, where, where um, God reveals to us, where Christ tells us, how do we handle something where we feel like we've been wronged or offended? And, and, and you mentioned the formula, Christ is very clear. We're to go privately to the person. And, and what's our goal in that? To make peace. And if, um, if the person won't hear of it, then we take one or two others with us. And, but the goal is, is again, to, to restoration of, of a friendship, um, to have peace with other people, as, as God calls us to do. Um, and then if a person won't hear two or three, then we're to take it to the church, which means generally that in, in our um, in our federation would be the consistory. Um, but the goal is, is this, this peacefulness that we're trying to maintain. But it sounds like what you're asking, what do you do if, if it's a Christian not in a church or not, not in this particular church? Is that right, Yvonne? That are from various denominations and they're not in I think um, the, the general principle would still apply. You know, when you have a, when we have an, you, you use the word issue, when we have an issue or a conflict or a problem with another person, we want to deal with it privately. We don't want to make it a matter of gossip. Um, we want to deal with it privately, and I think that principle holds there. And even within that organization, if the person won't hear, you privately, perhaps gather one or two others to include maybe a friend of that person, um, another leader in, the, in that organization, and you try as well to deal with it. Because again, remember what your goal is. It's peace. It's reconciliation. It's not division. And sometimes when these things aren't handled in a, in a good, helpful way, as Christ teaches in Matthew 18, they can lead to division. They can lead to further con conflict. So it's there to say, I, it's like the Lord saying, I know you're going to have conflict. I know somebody's going to wrong you for something, or you're going to feel wrong. And here's a way that, that you can use to resolve it. Does, it, does that help? Um, just looking at Joshua 24, verse 1, it knows the hearts of all of us. And I really believe that he will lead our hearts what needs to be done, if anything. Yeah, and, and we'll see that here, you know, in, in teaching from Ephesians 2 and then in 4, especially, there's more instruction for how we are to preserve the unity that we enjoy in Christ Jesus. Yes, Les. Uh, they were going to go to war with their brothers until they found 
concern and with the help of the elders and stuff, what what is Mark going to war over? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Martin Luther, in effect, went to war with the with the Catholic Church because they have perverted the gospel and he had to stand up and, and you know, this is it. But there's lots of times where we want to go to war and we shouldn't. Yeah, it, and uh, yeah, what yeah, what you're saying is that, that Israel was ready to go to war against their brothers um, for the sake of God's law, His ceremonial law in in the sacrificial um, um, ordinances, uh, and and Martin Luther, as as you mentioned, Calvin, others, the reformers, um, made a stand. Um, what was Luther's? Famous saying, here I stand. Um, I think with the reformers, though, and I don't want to go too far afield here, remember they were, they were wanting to reform the church. They wanted to go, there's this Latin phrase, ad fontes, back to the sources. They wanted to go back to the church. They felt like Rome had drifted away from it in many ways, um, the worship and in, in the immorality that was occurring in the church. Um, against the word of God, so you come back, you know, to the five solas of the Reformation. Um, but they wanted, they didn't see it as dividing, or I, I, I wouldn't, I don't know that I would use the word war. It, it, it was, they're trying to reform the church, they're trying to bring it back to the word of God. That that's, that's the source um, of our faith and practice. And um, he didn't want the division. Um, I don't think the reformers wanted it. They saw that that was the church, but it had become apostate in so many different ways. So it needed a reformation. Am I? And 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 then to. Yeah. And they had to do it very publicly. Um, you know, there were efforts made to deal with things privately. And I mean, even the disputation that really started in the 95 Theses was, let's talk about these things in an academic setting. But, but let's, let's talk about these things and start to think, what does the Word of God teach us about these? Um, I think in, in our day, Unfortunately, we're, in, in my experience, and I think it's been the experience of the church, where people make a stand, it's, um, it's oftentimes on things that are not necessarily um, over the word of God or the gospel. I wish they were. But sometimes, unfortunately, and that's why I tried to bring James in, because I think James teaches us very well in James 4, that what causes quarrels and fights and conflicts among you, it's oftentimes what I desire, as opposed to what does God, what does Christ desire here? But I think also, as, as I'll, I'll look um, at Ephesians 4, and as, you, as uh, Yvonne, you and I were talking, it teaches us to how to do that. How do you, when you have disagreements, how do we act in that? It doesn't say don't have disagreements. There are reasons to have disagreements. Um, but how we handle them is critical, I think, in the, in the teaching from the Word of God, um, with humility, with patience, with gentleness, with love, um, as opposed to James, I desire, I covet, and I can't have, so I start to go to war with people. That's not good. We want to avoid that. Does that, does that help, Les? Yeah. Any, any? Yeah. yeah Ron. Maybe it's not too much of a stretch to say there's another lesson that can be taken from the two and a half tribes. They were worried about their kids. Yeah. They were worried about future generations. Yeah. So they wanted to build something that was called the witness. Yeah. To protect the future generations. Exactly. And that's good because, I mean, if there's one word that describes the book of Deuteronomy, or at least the first half, it's remember. Don't forget. You're going to have all these good things and you're going to forget. 
and um, or even the warning in Hosea. Um, um, because in, in so many words, I think it's Hosea 10. No, 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 I'm sorry. Um, don't quote me, but I'll, I can show it to you later. It may be six. Because you have forgotten me, I will forget you. Because you have uh, forgotten knowledge, I'm paraphrasing, knowledge, I will forget your children. You see, we have to have this knowledge, like I think the altar of witness was intended, to remind our children who they are. They're members of the covenant. They're members of God's people by covenant. And we do things, those two and a half tribes were doing something to try to help in a visual way to remember that they're part of Israel and the sacrifice that pointed to the promised Messiah, the Messiah, the, the point of the covenants was through an altar. And so that their children would not forget along the lines of the warnings of Deuteronomy especially. All right, well, let's turn to Ephesians 2. Um, what, what Paul is writing about here is not a fragile unity like Israel had in the context of Joshua 22. He's talking about division. He's talking about a division and disunity between Jews and Gentiles. He says um, in Ephesians 2, as I'll read, it's the Gentiles are separated from the people of God. They're separated from Christ. So it's not a fragile unity. It is disunity. It is division between Jew and Gentile. So hear that as I, as I read, um, starting in Ephesians 2, verse 11 to the end. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you, and he's speaking to Gentiles, he's speaking to us, we're Gentiles, that you at that time were separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, such a classic Pauline statement, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. It might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and he preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Um, let me begin with just a little bit of context. I think we're all familiar with the first part of chapter 2, that we're saved by grace through faith. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. But now he's talking, as, as the heading in the, in the ESC puts it, we're one in Christ. He's addressing, what about Gentiles and what about Israel? What about Jews and Gentiles? And what he says specifically when he says you is he's talking to the Gentiles when he says, remember that you were, and he uses three pairs of words, um, separated, alienated, strangers. You were separated. You were alienated, you were strangers. And then he uses three more pairs of words. 
from Christ, from Israel, the covenant of promise. Separated, alienated strangers from Christ, from Israel, from the covenant of promise. Um, you see the parallels that he's drawing there? If you're separated from Christ, you're separated from Israel, you're separated from the covenant of promise. If you're separated from the com covenant of promise, you're separated from that nation where the promises were made, the promise of the Messiah, you're separated from Christ, you're alienated, you're strangers. And he says, when he talks about the covenant of promise, he says covenants, plural, covenants of promises. This is the covenant of grace that he's talking about, the covenant of grace in different administrations, the Abrahamic, the Mosaic, uh, the Davidic, on into the new covenant. Covenants of promise, promise of what? Promise of a Messiah. Promise of God himself who would send his son to save his people. And you can see the result of it in the, in the phrase that you'll read over and over in the Old Testament, I will be your God and you will be my people. This is what it means to be in the covenant of promise. And he's saying, Gentiles, who are not part of Israel, you're separated, alienated, and strangers to the Messiah, who's the subject of the promises, and from Israel, to whom the promises were given. Um, this is an echo of Paul's theme from his earlier letter, Galatians 3, when he says in 16, 18, now the promises... Here's the covenant of promises again. Were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. You see how Paul's drawing the connection between the promise? What is the promise? Christ. He's quoting, or he's referring to God's promise to Abraham in Genesis 12:3. In your seed, in your offspring, singular, all the nations of the earth will be, bre will be blessed. And this is even coming back to Genesis 3.15. The seed of the woman will crush the seed of the serpent. There's the gospel beginning its run all the way through the Old Testament to the incarnation. He says in, in Galatians 3.17 then, this is what I mean. The law which came 430 years after does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. The promise continues. For if the inheritance, the inheritance of Abraham, being heirs of God, if the inheritance comes by the law, it no, no longer comes by promise. And here's the key. But God gave it to Abraham by a promise. God gave it to Abraham by a promise. And if you're a Gentile at this time when Paul's writing to Ephesus, he's saying, you're outside of that. You're strangers, aliens, and separated from Christ Israel and the covenant of promise. Now then, but we read starting in 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. What does brought near mean? What does it mean for Israel to be near to God? It means the tabernacle. It means the sacrificial system. It means worship of God through the sacrificial system, the ceremonial law, the ordinance, if you will, of all the sacrifices. But he's saying, but what Paul is saying is, in Christ Jesus, you who are far off, you Gentiles, You've now been brought near to God. You're no longer separated and, and far away from God, but you've been brought near, how? By the blood of Christ. It's Christ's sacrifice who brings the Gentiles near to God the Father. That's reconciliation. He says it for Christ, he himself is our peace. He's our peace. This is the reconciliation that I was hoping to relate um, in, in Joshua 22, that, that where both parties, even though they were at conflict and war, were reconciled to one another through the mediation of Phineas and the delegation from the Ten Tribes. 
reconciliation here that Paul's talking about is reconciliation to God. Listen to this in 2 Corinthians 5.18. All this, and he's talking about new creation, as we read earlier um, in the assurance of salvation, or the assurance of forgiveness, 2 Corinthians 5.17, you're a new creature, all things are new, the old has passed away. In the next verse in, in 2 Corinthians 5.18, he writes, all this new creation is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So here in Ephesians 2.14, he says, for he himself, Christ Jesus, is our peace. And then he says, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostilities. What Christ's sacrifice did, his blood, as it says in verse um, 13, brought near by the blood of Christ, it gave us peace with God. It made us Jew and Gentile, one people of God. The far, the Gentiles, have been brought near to God by the blood of Christ. It says we're no longer hostile with one another. And it says both of us, all of us, have been reconciled to God. How? By the blood of Christ. What he's talking about is what Christ created, what Christ did, what he accomplished. Let me say it that way, not created. But what Christ accomplished was this reconciliation that breaks down the dividing wall breaks down the dividing wall between Jew and Gentile. Now, if you think about dividing wall and you think about Ephesus at that time, it's possible that they're talking about the division within the temple where the Gentiles were not allowed to pass beyond this wall in the temple in Jerusalem. Um, they were not allowed, and if they did, they were subject to death. So there's an allusion probably to that dividing wall that separated the Jews and the Gentiles from access to God, the Holy of Holies, if you will, that has been broken down by Christ Jesus. But as Paul goes on here, he says, um, abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, Christ once and for all sacrifices put an end to the Mosaic sacrificial system. The Mosaic sacrificial system was merely pointing to Christ as the archetype, as the sacrifice, which that's the Mosaic sacrificial system merely pointed to. So it says, those law of commandments expressed in ordinances have been done away, have been abolished. And, and then Paul goes on to say, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. You see, the peace between the two peoples was created, was, was accomplished. The reconciliation about two opposing people was accomplished by Christ's sacrifice. He makes us both one, and he says, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, there's his sacrifice again, killing, thereby killing the hostility. The hostility has gone away, it's been destroyed. And he says again, and he came and preached peace to you who were far off. Here's the far off again, the Gentiles who were far off, separated, alienated, apart from Christ, Israel, and the gospel, and the covenants of grace. For through him, in 18, for through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So now he sh what Paul is doing is he's shifting from looking at the sacrifice of Christ that reconciles us to God and makes one new man, one new body, one new people of God together, reconciled together, no longer hostile, and he's moving to the unity in the spirit, one spirit. And he says what makes us one spirit in the Father is you're no longer strangers and aliens. He's echoing back to the first part of chapter 2. You're not a stranger and alien anymore, but what are you? Fellow citizens with saints and members of the household of God. So let me spend a little time on that. Fellow citizens of God's household. 
How does that happen? Well, first of all, if you're thinking of a citizen, you would think of, okay, a citizen of Israel, if you will. Or he's in Ephesus, a citizen of Rome, or a citizen of Ephesus. What does it mean to be a citizen? It means you have rights and privilege. You have rights and privilege that, privileges that go along with that citizenship. And so he's using that um, analogy, if you will, to tell us that we're now citizens of the household of God. We're members of the household of God that come with all its privileges. Um, listen to Paul again in Galatians 3.26 in this regard. It says, For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God. Hmm. What about daughters? No, you're all sons of God. What does it mean to be a son of God? It means you're adopted. Christ is the only natural son of God, but we are a son of God by adoption. He's declared us his children. And to be a son means you're an heir. If you're the firstborn son, you're the heir and receive a double portion. But you're an heir of God as a member of his household by adoption. So Paul writes in three in Galatians 3.26, he says, For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew or Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring. Back to Genesis 12, 15, and 17. You are heirs according to promise. Not law, but promise. The promise of a Messiah, the promise of grace, the promise of salvation, the promise of adoption as sons of God and citizens of his household. Now, Paul talks about you're being built up into the temple, the dwelling place of God. Where does the Spirit dwell? The Spirit dwells in us. The Spirit dwells in us. He says, being built on the foundation of the prophets and apostles, Christ the cornerstone. You're being built as a temple with Christ as the cornerstone. And you know, a cornerstone, if you set the cornerstone right, the rest of the building will probably be constructed quite well. Mess up the cornerstone, and it's not going to be square. It's not going to be strong. It won't work. Christ is the cornerstone, but the foundation is laid by the prophets and the apostles. In other words, what he's reminding us here is it was all about Christ from the beginning. He's the subject of the covenants. He's the Messiah. He's the one who Scripture writes about. He's the one revealed to us as God saving his people. Remember in Luke 24, 27, on the road to Emmaus, what does Jesus say? He says, in beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. First, uh, Peter writes about it in his first letter. He says, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ. In other words, the prophets are predicting the sufferings of Christ Jesus. And, as Peter writes, the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, and the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit, sent from heaven things in, into which angels long to look. In other words, the Spirit came and preached the gospel to all God's people from the beginning, and the gospel was Christ, the sufferings and the glories that he would accomplish on our behalf. So what we are is we're built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Christ is the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place of God 
by the Spirit. So what has Paul done in this short section of his letter to Ephesus? He started with flesh, and he ends with spirit. When you think of spirit, don't, don't think disembodied. Being human is to be embodied. It's to have a body. But in new creation, new creation like we read in 2 second, second, um, Corinthians 5.17, it's a new body. It's a body born of the spirit. It's a person born of the spirit. The flesh is gone. It's no more the circumcision that's made by hands, made in the flesh by hands, is done away by Christ. The ordinances and the sacrifices are gone because Christ accomplished the one and only sacrifice. And the result of that is what? Unity. Unity. It's the unity that we have in Christ Jesus. That's what unifies us. Now, the question, though, you go is, okay, that's the doctrine, that's the theology, that's the gospel, that's what Christ accomplished. We're now one people of God united together in Christ Jesus. How do we do this? How do we, do the, how do we stay united? What work do we do to remain united when we're still battling against the old man? We're still battling against the sin. Yes, we're dying more and more in sin, and by the grace of God, we're living more and more to righteousness as he conforms us to the image of Christ Jesus. But how do we walk? What do we do? Look over at Ephesians 4. And I think Paul has picked up the theme about the unity that we have in Christ Jesus. And now he's saying, he gives us a therefore. Because you're unified in Christ Jesus as one people of God, and you're no longer strangers and aliens, you're adopted members of the household of God, he says, therefore, as a, um, as a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you to walk. In other words, I, I urge you to act this way. I urge you to do these things. Because you're in unity with Christ and each other, Walk in a manner worthy of the calling for which you have been called. In other words, be who you are. You're a child of God. You're a son of God. You're adopted into his household. Be who you are. Be, walk in a manner worthy of the calling. And then he says, what is that manner? He says, first of all, be united. Be unified. Be together. How? Humility. Humility, which means you're looking to the interests of other people. You look out for others. You try to do what they need, what God wants them to have. You're not so much looking at yourself or like James taught us, our own desires, our own passions, my own feelings. You're looking out for the interests of others. That's humility. He says patience. Is God patient with us? It's immeasurable patience. It's immeasurable patience when we think about when we know our own heart, when we know our own failings, we know our own sins, we know our own troubles, our own weaknesses. And yet God is lovingly patient beyond measure with us. So he calls us to be patient with one another. He says love. Love means others are more important than us. It means giving up yourself sacrificially for the benefit of another. Sometimes we think, what can I do for this person? What can I do to fix the problem? What can I do to bring about reconciliation and peace? And we try to think of all these measures and techniques. And God gives us instructions on that. I mean, in, in James, the same way. He tells us how to deal with conflict with one another. Or as Yvonne mentioned, talking about Matthew 18, how to resolve a conflict. He gives us very practical means of doing it. But when all else fails, love each other. If your motive, as God knows the heart, is love for one another, love really does cover a multitude of sins. 
when you can do nothing else and you feel like everything I'm doing is failing, love another person. I mean, it is the second great commandment. Love God and to love each other. That will help you maintain the unity of the Spirit. What we're after is not compromising the Word of God. What we're after is maintain unity informed by the Word of God. Striving for unity, striving for reconciliation, striving for peace amongst ourselves. God has, through Christ, made peace between God and ourselves. Now he reconciles us to one another by love, by the love of Christ. And why? Why would you do all this? Why would you strive to have peace and unity and fellowship and humility and patience and love with one another? We're brothers and sisters. We're members of the household of God. We're all adopted. We're all, we were all orphans, and he's adopted us into his household, which makes us all brothers and sisters. And that means we want to love one another as we love our, our brothers and sisters in the flesh. He says, he goes on in four, he says, because there's one Lord, there's one faith, there's one baptism, there's one God the Father, there's one people of God who are united in Christ Jesus. There's one people of God united in Christ Jesus, united by Christ, united by the covenants of promise, and members of the household of God, the true Israel that in Christ went from one small nation to the ends of the earth as the waters covered the sea. That's why we strive to have unity, because we are, in Christ Jesus, one. Let's pray. Lord, sometimes when we read and hear and learn of your word, It does drive us to humility because we realize that though we strive in our own strength and by our own will and we think we can do these things on our own, we know we can't. And so we cry out to you, like the two and a half tribes in Joshua 2, that you are almighty and that you, the Lord, are God. We cry out to you and we pray, continue to pour out your spirit, the spirit that unites us together as one, as your adopted children in your household. Unify us, make us one, grant us peace, grant us humility, gentleness, and above all, pour out your love to us that we will love you and love one another for you have called us to do this with thanksgiving and gratitude. In Christ Jesus, whose name we pray, amen.